Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us back to eastern Alaska, near the area around Glen Allen and the junction of highways 1 and 4. The muskeg and lowland forest here are crowded with patches of fir, birch, and aspen trees with willow and alder along every shoreline. The moose here are plentiful and predators of the area include wolves, black and brown bears. The undergrowth of this area is thick and provides a very dense screen for these predators to hide behind as they stalk moose or any other prey that catches their fancy. Hunting is still a way of life for many residents, but in prior decades it was even more integral to survival. Back in the 1950s, Lloyd Penny Pennington was doing what he loved, flying over the Alaska backcountry and checking out potential hunting areas. His favorite was to watch brown bears as they prepared to den up, as their behavior at that season was a tell as to where they would den for the winter. The bears would tend to lay near their desired denning spot for several days, seemingly waiting for the season to finally turn past the point where they would need to give into hibernation. As he scanned the scrub below, he found exactly what he was looking for on the hillside above Snowshoe Lake. The season did finally change long after Penny had returned home and began waiting out the long, cold winter at his lodge, a dozen or so miles east of Gunsight Mountain Lodge. It was located a few hours up the Glen Highway and offered easy access to the back country and pursuit of his passions, hunting and fishing. As the dark twilight of winter faded and the weeks wore on, springtime began to signal its arrival. In the lower elevations the snow began to melt and leaves started to bud. This was Lloyd's sign that the bears hibernating in higher elevations would be leaving their dens soon. Lloyd contacted his close friend, Everett Kendall, his longtime barber and friend who had expressed a desire to bag a giant Bruin before hanging up his hunting rifle for good. The two men lifted off in Lloyd's bush plane and were soon among the clouds and headed toward the hibernating behemoth. The mountains and trees passed by as if it were a giant piece of art. The lush spring greenery is broken by white patches of snow and ice. Deep blue lakes as pure as any water in the world sparkled below as the bush plane started to descend toward their planned destination. As the plane skidded to a stop on the patch of ice, the hunters began to focus on the task at hand. Lloyd immediately disconnected his seat belt and began digging through his gear to locate his rifle and binoculars. The two men disembarked the plane and briefly discussed their plan to bring the beautiful, powerful Bruin home. As they hiked up the ice patch trail, they kept a watchful eye on the hillside above them for any wildlife, both for the sights they may see, but also to avoid any dangerous confrontations. The trail climbed a few hundred feet and the men started to feel their age and lack of physical fitness. They paused to glass the muskeg below them for any signs of life. After a few hours of slow progress, they arrived at the line of trees that marked where the bear was still denned up. Lloyd cautiously made his way to within a few yards of the opening of the den and noticed that the bear had already opened the snow at the entrance. This was a sign that Lloyd was all too familiar with, and he immediately understood that the bear would be emerging within just a few hours and be extremely hungry. The two men, weary from their hike, decide to go about a hundred yards down the hill and enjoy a cigarette. As they made their way down the hill, they discussed the point from which they will plan to shoot the bear and the best way to recover the carcass. Lloyd found a small tree that was blown over, and the two men settled in for a smoke and small talk. They lit up their smokes and shared short stories about their life experiences and put their cigarettes out to get ready to get in place. As Kendall started to stand, he heard a loud roar and looked up to see the largest bear leaping toward him faster than he could process the predicament he and his friend were in. The saliva frothed from the deadly predator's mouth and its five-inch claws seemed to grow in size upon sight. Many people who have seen brown bears charging toward them indicate that it is mind-boggling to see such a massive creature moving through brush and broken terrain so quickly, and Kendall was no different. 
The elderly hunter tried to turn and run, but only got about three steps into his retreat when the enormous force of the impact of the bear's attack drove him face first into a hard, frozen snowbank. His rifle tumbled uselessly through the air and clattered onto the gravel bar several feet from the hapless hunter, now prey. The bear's giant canine teeth tore through the back of his skull and extinguished the light of his life in an instant. At that moment, Lloyd had just watched his longtime friend be killed before he could even click his safety off. The athletic and hungry bear turned from Kendall and glared at Lloyd for a split second before he turned and charged toward Lloyd. It wasn't enough for the bear that one man was killed, but that each threat it perceived be eliminated. Lloyd fired once, twice, three times, striking the bear in the foot but not hitting anything vital and unable to slow the murder-minded predator. The bear streaked toward Lloyd at incomprehensible speed. The powerful teeth crushed the hunter's arm first and then the bear flung Lloyd to the ground. The Bruin pounced on the hunter with his front legs to hold him down as he tore and bit the man about the head and neck. The pain shot through Lloyd's body like lightning and his consciousness faded and he ceased the fight for his life. Lloyd's good friend Rick Houston started to get concerned when the hunters hadn't returned when they said they would and decided to investigate to make sure they were okay. He boarded his bush plane and took off in the direction Lloyd had told him they would be hunting. A short while later, the pilot is searching the large area and witnesses the two hunters' bodies, still and motionless on the snowbank. He recognizes that the worst-case scenario has occurred and heads back to gather men to bring this fatal encounter to an end and recover his friends. The search party return to the airspace above the attack scene and track the bear over 30 miles by plane up the valley. When they finally located the bear at the end of the tracks in the snow, the bear stood defiantly on his hind legs and swatted at the distant bush plane menacingly. The search party landed nearby and immediately started to locate and eliminate the violent predator. As the men closed to a few hundred yards from the bear, he let out a roar that caused them all to briefly reconsider their mission. The brush started to erupt as if it was trying to get out of the bear's way on its own will. The giant Bruin, head low and full of rage, knocked down small trees and bush alike in its enraged pursuit of the men. Confusion reigned as the men moved for a good shooting lane in the thick brush. Shots began to ring out, one after another and then more. Finally the anger and hate in the bear's eyes faded as it fell only twenty feet from the closest search party member. The men skinned the bear and noted that this robust and healthy bear measured eight feet from its nose to its tail once its skin was removed. Even with a lifetime of experience at hunting bears on their terms, every advantage the men had was not enough to save their lives, and now their friends labored to remove their bodies and give them the peaceful burial they deserved. After presenting the details of this case, I have a few questions for you. Do you think the bear was irritated by the presence of the people so close to his den or the smoke from their cigarettes more? Why do you think the men sat down with their backs to the opening of the bear den? Do you think the bear knew there were humans in the bush plain when it stood and swatted at it? Do you support trophy hunting? Do you support subsistence hunting? I will love to read and answer your comments, so please post them below and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country. I want to close by thanking our Patreons by name. Biotoxic Beast, Gary Eric, K. Seal Rose, Victor Senkyu, Abhishek Bunia, J. Tracy Green, Young Games 34 underscore, Nina Allison, Heather Lee, Christian, Darren Terrell, Sean Perry, Kristen Himes, Devona Eat Pizza, Matt, Mochi, Connor Lavin, Stephen Wilkinson, Werner Voss, L, Justin Curry, Godzilla, Susan Holt Butterfield, Sebastian Kielak, Brandon Wizard Wood, Nicole N, Aaron Blanton, Oswin Balimia, Angel Barnhill, Joey Pinter, Mauro Padano, Bubri, TJ Schools, Katie V. Wright, Gary Highland, Cody Love, K. 
Catsy Murphy Andrews, Matt Bagnier, Cherry Og, Lindy, Dawn, Ian Romalor, Darcio Pacifico, Rose H, Lori McKay, Melissa Gottlieb, Megan Trend, Nathan P, Cole Rodriguez, Aurora, April Donovan, Ryan Cernicky, Chris Marler, Wayne Washington, Fluffy Feet, Cheyenne, Greg Schaefer, April Donovan, and Drone Adventures. Your support means the world to me.